Could any sane person commit the terrible atrocities of Adolf Hitler? Or was he just born evil? And what does Hitler's possibly deformed genitalia have to do with any of this? We have the answers, and if you find yourself asking these questions, the truth behind it all might surprise and horrify you. One of the most important books that wrestles with the timeless question of Hitler's sanity is Hitler, Diagnosis of a Destructive Prophet by Dr. Fritz Redlich. Dr. Redlich was a neurologist and psychiatrist who studied Hitler extensively, allowing him to publish the first ever medical and psychological book on the infamous dictator. But who is Dr. Fritz Redlich and what gives him such a fascinating insight into the mind of this monster? Dr. Redlich was a Jewish man from Austria who trained as a psychologist in Vienna before World War II, but like many who shared his faith, he had to flee his homeland, arriving in the United States in 1938, where he continued his work. Although he escaped Hitler's oppression, he didn't forget about what he did to his people. In 1942, Redlich joined Yale University as a faculty member. He would become Dean of the School of Medicine, and from 1950 to 1967, he was the head of the Department of Psychiatry. Redlich was a member of the Institute of Medicine and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and many who knew him thought of him as one of the brightest minds in his field. So, we have a highly qualified, potentially even genius Jewish psychologist who'd personally been a victim of Hitler's crimes against humanity. We can't think of anyone better to take on this intimidating question. But what sparked Dr. Redlich to specifically write about Hitler's mental health? While he was a professor of psychiatry at Yale University and the University of California, Los Angeles, he began researching in order to refute the toxic beliefs of Holocaust deniers. One theory among those revisionists was that Hitler was manipulated by his personal physician, Dr. Theodore Morell, while in a state of mental fragility. He needed to dig deep to eliminate this theory that essentially let Hitler off the hook. Redlich was aware that many people had delved into Hitler's psyche before, with varying degrees of success, so rather than performing a straightforward analysis of his medical condition, he decided to be a lot more thorough. He made a pathography, a term Redlich used in reference to studying the life and character of an individual as it is being influenced by disease. Dr. Redlich was able to study every aspect of Hitler's mental and physical health. He looked into Hitler's own statements, and he pored over Dr. Morell's medical records and even his diary to find answers. Dr. Redlich's research would take him a decade or so to complete, giving him perhaps the best look into the mind of Adolf Hitler that had ever been created. Before we delve deeper into the specifics of Redlich's findings, there is an important thing to note. Redlich's pathography approach demands a full look at the subject's mental and physical health. And when people study Hitler, one thing that's often left out of the discussions is his myriad physical health problems. He had plenty of ailments in his life, suffering from severe abdominal spasms, bloating, and constipation. At the beginning of the 1930s, he reported that he had a buzzing and a ringing in his ears, which was a sign he had tinnitus. And that wasn't the end of it, of course. He also had hypertension, headaches, and heart trouble. On October 14, 1918, in Belgium, Hitler, then a corporal in the German army, was even temporarily blinded by a British gas shell. He was then evacuated to a German military hospital in Passivalk, and that would lead to eye problems later on down the road, such as eye pain and hazy vision. Fun fact though, some believe that Hitler's claim of being blinded by mustard gas was a lie. According to The Independent, unpublished letters from two American neurologists indicate that he was actually treated for hysterical amblyopia rather than mustard gas. The more commonly known name is hysterical blindness. University of Aberdeen's Thomas Weber made the letters available in his book, Hitler's First War, in 2010. According to Weber's book, the letters were written in 1943. The Americans had spoken with Alfred Forster, a German neurologist and neurosurgeon. Forster claims to have seen Hitler's medical files from the military hospital in Passivalk in 1918. The file clearly showed he had not been treated for mustard gas, but for, yep, you guessed it, hysterical blindness. However, the actual letters themselves have been destroyed. Hitler has gone to great lengths to hide his World War I medical history. It really makes you wonder what he felt like he needed to hide. Weber believes that proving Hitler's blindness was the result of mental illness might shine a light on Hitler's radical personality change after the war. Before the war, he was an awkward loner. Afterward, he became a charismatic leader, and any explanation for this change so far has been mainly conjecture. This information was released after Redlich's death, so it's unclear what he might have made of this addition, but thankfully Hitler's bizarre medical history still left plenty for Redlich to research. For example, Redlich notes that at the end of Hitler's life he had Parkinson's syndrome. Redlich also diagnosed him with spina bifida occulta, a mild type of spina bifida. 
which is when a baby's spine and spinal cord don't fully develop in the womb. He also diagnosed him with hypospadias, a birth defect where the opening of the urethra is not located at the tip of the penis. Along with pulling from Morell's diary of records, Redlich also looked into interviews with the daughter of Hitler's photographer, Henrietta Hoffmann von Skirach, and the work of Professor Ernst Gunther Schenk. Schenk was a doctor and former Nazi who wrote a German medical biography of Hitler, which Redlich was able to use in his studies of the now-dead monster. But that's not the end of Hitler's physical ailments. Redlich believes that Hitler might have had temporal or giant cell arteritis, meaning his arteries, especially those near his temples, were inflamed. It's an autoimmune disease that might explain Hitler's frequent headaches, as well as his cardiac problems and bad vision. On top of all this, one rumor you might have heard about Hitler is that he had only one testicle. The rumor was started by a Soviet pathologist who filed an autopsy report after he allegedly examined the bodies removed from Hitler's bunker. It's hard to say how true this is. Of course, it might be, but it might also be the Soviets trying to imply Hitler was sexually defective. Redlich didn't give a final verdict on what he believed, but he did note that monarchism or the absence of one testicle can be associated with the previously mentioned hypospadias. So why is this holistic look at Hitler's health so important to understanding his mindset and the bizarre paradox at the heart of Hitler's belief system? Nazis happily killed anyone who didn't live up to their ideals of the master race, like the physically and mentally disabled. They wanted a genetically pure society. That alone makes Hitler's long list of medical ailments hypocritical. If Hitler had been on the other side of his own destruction, he would have very likely met his end in the Nazis' euthanasia program. But this did nothing to change his ideals, hinting at a possible lack of the ability to feel empathy for his fellow human beings. But what about drug addiction as a potential explanation for Hitler's erratic and horrible behavior? Some believe that the Nazi leader was a drug addict, but Redlich didn't agree. Dr. Morell did prescribe Hitler amphetamines, however this wasn't uncommon during the era. Even though he did take the drugs, there was no signs that he was a drug addict. In fact, when he learned they were bad for him, he stopped taking them. Hitler also abstained from nicotine and alcohol entirely and was even a vegetarian. People have ascribed different motives to Dr. Morell, Hitler's personal physician, whom Holocaust deniers believe was the true architect of Hitler's crimes. Some believe he was a charlatan who was exploiting his boss, but others believe he was actively trying to harm Hitler. Renlich had his own conclusions. Dr. Morell was ignorant and made mistakes because of it. It's Occam's razor. The simple answer is probably the most likely to be correct. For example, Dr. Morell prescribed Hitler a mix of laxatives and opiates. This was incredibly foolish and dangerous. Yet, Dr. Morell seemed proud of the place his medical practices procured him in history. So it's unlikely it was an intentional attack on Hitler. Maybe Redlich was right, maybe Dr. Morell just made a lot of mistakes due to ignorance. With the physical portion of our pathography out of the way, let's look a little bit more at what Redlich had to say about Hitler's psychiatric profile. Redlich was, of course, not the first to look into the psyche of Hitler. In 1976, Rudolf Binion released a biography titled Hitler Among the Germans, where he states that Hitler's rage began with his mother's doctor. Meanwhile, the psychopathic god Adolf Hitler by Robert Waite notes that Hitler was sexually perverse. Redlich took a more even-handed approach to the whole thing. In fact, he felt most people's conclusions were far too simple. Many of Redlich's peers would settle on a more universal concept to explain Hitler's mental state rather than getting specific. Redlich wasn't as eager to say he simply had an Oedipus complex or a castration complex or any other Freudian buzzwords. He also felt that it was important to look at what Hitler believed to be true and apply it to his reasoning. Hitler had believed his father was half Jewish and died of syphilis. There's no evidence that that is true, yet as far as Hitler is concerned, it was true, and he acted accordingly. In fact, Redlich believed that Hitler may have even blamed his father for his spina bifida and hypospadias, since Hitler believed he had inherited syphilis from his father. The rage he felt for his father might explain why Hitler considered syphilis to be a quote, Jewish disease, and it may have contributed to his anti-Semitism. But is the origin of a person always the key to understanding their psychological makeup? Something that has puzzled psychologists and psychiatrists about Hitler's childhood is the fact that he didn't display a lot of signs of his inevitable evil behavior. Murderers normally torture and kill animals during their early childhood, before working up to humans. But as far as anyone knows, Hitler didn't hurt any animals as a child. In fact, Hitler felt affection for animals throughout his life. Surprisingly, all records show that he was an average child. He wouldn't start to grow more evil until he reached adulthood. So, let's take a look at these unusual signs and see if they hold any psychological water. 
As with any evil man, there are more accusations of sexual dysfunction. Redlich believed Hitler may never have had sexual intercourse with Eva Braun, but Heike Gortemarker, an Eva Braun biographer, said the couple had an average sex life. Hitler presented himself as a celibate man without a family so that he could be completely dedicated to politics. The other signs that made Hitler seem unusual were his phobia of diseases, explosive rages, delusions, and his unwavering belief he would die at a young age. At least we can say the last one didn't come to pass as he ended up dying at the age of 56. Redlich did attribute a list of mental illnesses to Hitler, including but not limited to paranoia, narcissism, anxiety, depression, and hypochondria. He was able to find something to back up the diagnosis for each one. However, Redlich had a more difficult time trying to prove if Hitler was self-destructive or sexually perverse. In fact, he seemed unimpressed with a lot of the diagnoses he did come up with. Redlich explained that when trying to diagnose Hitler with any of these, it felt like being in a cheap clothing store. Nothing fits and everything fits. Ultimately, Redlich felt it was useless to diagnose him. Hitler was completely responsible for his own actions, and it could not be explained by anxiety or paranoia. According to some sources, 40 million American adults suffer from anxiety, and not one of them has committed their own holocaust. Redlich's book left its mark on the psychology and historical communities. It's been praised for how in-depth and detailed it is, but if we just gave you the research and professional opinions of one source, we would not be giving you a complete picture. Others have come to far different conclusions than Redlich. Former director of the Harvard Psychological Clinic, Henry A. Murray, did a well-known psychological study of Hitler. Murray mentioned how little information there was on Hitler's childhood. Even so, we do know that Hitler was sickly and frail back then. His father had been described as physically and mentally abusive, and it was noted that he whipped him and his brother daily. His father died when he was 14, and after that, Murray believes Jewish people became a scapegoat for his hatred of his father. Murray believed Hitler's genocidal crimes were motivated by resentment and revenge, especially since he believed Hitler was a pathological narcissist. He hypothesized his behavior was to compensate for his feelings of inferiority. But of course, when you heard the word insane in the title of this video, pathological narcissism, anxiety, and potential sexual dysfunction were not on your mind. You might have been wondering whether Hitler was a clinical psychopath, a dictator with the mind of Hannibal Lecter. Surprisingly, Hitler seemed to lack some of the major traits associated with psychopathy. For instance, superficial charm and glibness is considered a symptom, and while Hitler was a charismatic public speaker, people who knew him personally felt he was quiet or even cold. It's also common for people with psychopathy to exhibit shallow experiences of feelings or emotions. This also doesn't line up with Hitler's profile, as those closest to him noted that he could be warm and affectionate. Some people even criticize trying to find answers behind Hitler's actions. They fear that trying to explain Hitler will inevitably lead people to make excuses for him. It's a fear that people will find a way to sympathize with someone as monstrous and as irredeemable as Hitler. Redlich felt differently on the matter. He explained, empathy is not the same as sympathy. And this is a man who, as a psychiatrist, states he tried to put himself in Hitler's shoes to really delve into his thoughts. Redlich may not have stayed in Austria during the war, but his life was turned upside down by Hitler. For him, it was not about helping people feel sorry for Hitler or trying to cultivate a defense for the Nazi leader. According to Redlich himself, this book is, in a way, my answer to Hitler. If we take into account everything Redlich has to say, we can say that Hitler was not insane, just evil. One little known and devastating fact seems to be the last piece of the puzzle. While we wonder how Hitler could have been okay with the inhumanity he was causing at concentration camps while still maintaining his sanity, it's important to know that Hitler never actually visited the camps. On one hand, this could have been a way of giving himself plausible deniability for the atrocities committed in his name. But it is equally likely that while Hitler wanted all this to happen, as a man who didn't even have the stomach to eat meat, he knew he couldn't watch it unfold. This gives us a definitive and depressing answer to the question of, how could a sane man do such horrible things? The answer being, he rationalized it and put distance between himself and the results of his actions, making the suffering of his millions of victims abstract and avoiding ever directly confronting the horrors he had wrought. If you liked this video, check out what happened immediately after Hitler died and the dark true story of Adolf Hitler, or watch this video instead.